most of the basic ideas of critical thinking have a very long history. They go back into ancient Greek philosophy and the foundations of logic. Today, we're going to look at one of the most important innovations in critical thinking, which was made by Socrates, a very important ancient Greek thinker who lived from 469 to 399 BCE. Socrates did not write a philosophical doctrine. He did not develop a theory of the universe or any of the other things that lots of philosophers did. What Socrates did was create a method of investigating what other people believe. It's a way of critically examining people's beliefs to see if they are consistent and to see if they make sense. And this way of investigating has been very influential throughout the entire history of, of philosophy and certainly the history of critical thinking. And so in this PowerPoint, we're gonna take a quick look at how Socrates did philosophy. And then in subsequent discussions, we'll look at a couple of examples of how Socrates engaged in philosophical inquiry with other people. In the apology or the defense speech Socrates will give at his trial, he goes to great lengths to argue that he is not a sophist and should not be associated with the sophists. So we should say a few words about who these people were. These were traveling teachers of rhetoric and skills of public speaking. These were important skills in democratic Athens where if you wanted to get something done, if you wanted to engage in a legal case, you had to be able to speak in public. You represented yourself. So skills of argumentation and rhetoric were very important. And since there was no formal school system, the, the sophists arose to, to fill this void. Now, the sophists had a bit of a shady reputation. I would compare them to the way in which at least some people talk about lawyers, at least if you're being cynical. Um, now, of course, you know lawyers are important, but they also have a reputation for not really caring about the truth so much as winning the case. They will do whatever it takes to win the case, and uh, they're motivated by making money. These are, are some of the same charges that were brought against the sophists, as we will see. And Socrates in the Apology will be very clear to, to say that he is that's not what he's up to. He doesn't take any money for what he does, and he cares about the truth. He doesn't just really want to win an argument. So let's look at some of the principal doctrines of the sophists so we can contrast what Socrates is doing with their activity. In ancient Athenian society, it was very important to be able to speak well in public. Ancient Athens was a democracy. So if you wanted to convince people to do something, whether it's in a legal context or in the assembly, you had to persuade the majority and you had to get up and speak in public. And so therefore rhetoric or the skills of persuasive public speaking were very important. The sophists were people who taught this. It was their job to teach young people, especially these skills of public speaking that would help them get ahead in life. If you were a wealthy person in Athens, you would, if you had children, often employ a sophist to teach your children these skills of public speaking. The issue with the sophists from the Socratic point of view is that the sophists weren't interested in the truth. This is why there's an opposition between the sophists and the philosophers. The philosophers like Socrates and Plato are opposed to the sophists because as philosophers, they are looking to achieve the truth about reality. Whereas the sophists didn't really care about that, or at least that was their reputation. They just wanted to win and then collect their fee. And so therefore there's an opposition between the, the philosophers and the sophists that Socrates will comment upon in the Apology where he makes it very clear that he is not a sophist, that he, that he does not take money for his teachings and that he shouldn't be associated with them and their bad reputation. The bad reputation of the sophists arose because they claimed anyway to be able to teach you to make any argument victorious, no matter how poor it was 
And they could also teach you to make the opposite of that argument victorious. They could make you equally persuasive on any side of an issue. Now, of course, if they could do that, that would be a very, very valuable skill to have. And so this was the reputation that the sophists acquired, that they were able to make the weaker argument the stronger. And therefore, they were seen as something of a threat to Athenian society because they allowed unscrupulous people to persuade the masses to do whatever they want. And that can be a very, very dangerous thing when you have a democratic society as they did in Athens. From the philosophical point of view, Sophism had at least two especially negative implications. The first is that it led to skepticism, the idea that there is no truth. The reason that it was seen to lead to skepticism is because the sophists argued that we could argue either side of an issue equally well, and that therefore there's no way to distinguish truth from mere opinion. And if all we have are opinions, then that means that there is no knowledge of how things actually are. And that's what the skeptical position is. Moreover, it was seen to lead to relativism because they rejected any notion of an external objective criterion of truth. According to the famous, pro, uh, the famous sophist Protagoras, we as individuals, each of us is the standard of truth. What's true for me is true for me, and I am the final arbiter of that, and what's true for you is true for you and you are the final arbiter of that. And so therefore we lose any sense of an external objective criterion of what is true and what is false. And Protagoras is especially famous for arguing of all things the measure is man, of existing things that they exist, of non-existing things that they do not exist. So this notion of uh, truth is relative to each individual goes well with the notion of skepticism that there is no one objective truth that we're all aiming at. And both of these together combine to give the, the sophists that kind of negative reputation uh, and to draw it caused them to draw the hostility of the philosophical community in particular. The issue of the Socratic method is controversial and many modern commentators disagree about whether there's any one standard approach that Socrates used that could be considered a method. That's probably true. He uses a variety of methods that share certain similar characteristics, but the idea that he has one absolute method is probably doubtful. Socrates himself never discussed a specific method of investigating people's beliefs. Rather, the details of this method have to be inferred. We have to reconstruct his method from the way it appears, especially in the dialogues that Plato wrote where Socrates appears. Nevertheless, it appears to be clear from these texts that Socrates has a specific goal in mind and a general manner of pr proceeding towards this goal, though he varies his approach depending on his audience and the kind of person he's dealing with. So let's talk about the Socratic method in general, and then we'll look at more specific examples as we proceed through the texts in which Socrates appears. So the name of the Socratic method of doing philosophy is the elenchus. And elenchus literally means a cross-examination. Here we see many of the previous ideas that we've established about Socrates kind of coming together. Remember, one of the most important things he says is that he doesn't know anything. And the Socratic method proceeds on that basic assumption. It's always the other person, the person Socrates is talking to, who claims to know something. And then by, by means of this elenchus or cross-examination, it, it will turn out usually that the person does not in fact know what they think they know. So the elenchus is a communal search for knowledge. You do this in conversation with someone else. And the goal of this conversation is not just knowledge about the world, but moral knowledge. That's always going to be Socrates' principal interest. Socrates wants to know how to be a good person, how to be a virtuous person. And of course, uh, since virtue is knowledge, then we have to acquire certain knowledge in order to be virtuous, and the knowledge we acquire is in, form, in the form of definitions, uh, definitions of what is holy, what is 
temperate, what is just, for example. And once we know these concepts, then we can act upon them. So they become a, a guide to our moral actions. So that's how we bring all the elements together. Someone claims to know about virtue. Socrates says that he wants to learn. The person tells Socrates what they know. And then Socrates cross-examines that person to see if what they've said makes any sense. And we'll see this in great detail in the Euthyphro, where Euthyphro will present himself as a moral expert, an expert in religious matters, uh, especially the uh, issue of holiness. He claims to be an expert on all things that are holy, but as it turns out in the course of the conversation, Euthyphro really doesn't have the first idea of what holiness is. And so this is another aspect of the Socratic method that you often see in these dialogues of Plato, and that is uh, an encounter with Socrates uh, may not be a very pleasant thing because uh, what ends up happening is that you are revealed in your ignorance, and that can be uh, embarrassing, all right, especially if you have a, a very prominent role in society and this cross-examination is taking place in public and can be a very humiliating experience. It's important to keep in mind, however, that uh, Socrates is not just trying to embarrass people. Uh, that would be a petty kind of interpretation of what he's trying to do. I think we could say that he is sincere. He is sincerely trying to reach the truth with respect to moral judgments. And he does believe that there is a truth uh, and that this truth is conceptual and we get at it through definitions. So this linguistic analysis is the key to the Socratic method. So let's take a look at, at how a typical Alenkis would proceed in more detail. Our first reading where the Socratic method is emphasized is going to be the Euthyphro, which we're going to be reading next. In the Euthyphro, you get a pretty standard model of a typical Elenchus, a typical Socratic cross-examination. And here I want to just talk to you a little bit about the general details, the general way in which such an encounter takes place, so that when you read the Euthyphro, you could see that as a more specific example of this general approach. So as we know, Socrates has no knowledge, especially moral knowledge. This is what he's looking for. So he's always on the alert for someone else claiming to have knowledge. And of course, as we know, there's no shortage of people who want to tell you what they know in this world. So he will often find somebody who claims to have knowledge, especially about some moral concept that he's concerned with, like holiness or temperance or justice or courage or any of a whole range of morally relevant terms that he wants to have knowledge about. Now, Socrates claims to be ignorant about the matter, but is willing to be instructed. This is an important point. This, this claim that Socrates makes not to have any knowledge is often referred to as Socratic irony. Ironic because it's not clear whether he does or doesn't actually know. So he may know, but be claiming the opposite, which is the essence of uh, an ironic kind of claim. So he claims not to have any knowledge about the matter, but is willing to be constructed. And since the other person has claimed to know, Socrates says, well, then you can tell me. If you know what you're talking about, let's say if you know about holiness, then you can tell me what holiness is by giving me a definition that can stand up to critical scrutiny. So the form of question that Socrates asks is, what is holiness? And the answer that he's looking for is a definition that captures the essence of that concept that we looked at earlier, right? the universally relevant, essential nature of that particular term. And so the person with whom he's talking proposes a definition of the moral term. And here that's indicated as idea A. So A is the, uh, is the definition that's given. So at this point, Socrates proposes that they examine this definition to see if it makes sense. Is it contradictory or does it make any sense? Does it fit together with other things we believe to be true or does it contradict other things that we believe to be true? 
The only stipulation that Socrates places on this cross-examination is that as he asks the respondent questions, that person must only say what they believe to be true. In other words, this is not intended as the kind of mere verbal wordplay games with words, if you will, that the sophists were often engaged in. Socrates is not interested in making the weaker argument appear stronger. He wants to get at the truth, and he wants to get at exactly what a person believes. So therefore, they must say what they believe to be true. He's got to have the truth in order for the method to proceed properly. Okay. So in the course of conversing with Socrates, Socrates discovers that the respondent also has another belief, perhaps in the background of their assumptions about the world, something that they take to be true, and this is belief B. So they have proposed a definition A, but they also have a belief B. And what Socrates brings out is that this other thing that they believe, idea B, cannot be held at the same time A is held, that there's something contradictory between the two. You can't believe A and B at the same time. One or the other has to be given up. Now, usually, belief B is something that is very deeply a part of the person's belief system so that they're not easily willing to give up that belief. And therefore, the definition of A, the moral term in question, is what gets rejected. Rather than giving up the entire framework of their beliefs, they give up the, the definition that they proposed. Now, in the Euthyphro, what we're going to see is that this proposal of a definition and its criticism and its ultimate failure is going to be a process that repeats several times until basically the conversation kind of collapses without any resolution whatsoever. And the term for this is aporia. That is, the, the Euthyphro will be a typical example of a Socratic dialogue because it ends in aporia. It ends without resolution. We're not given a definitive answer to the question of, in this case, what is, what is holiness. The point here is that in the course of this conversation with Socrates, it becomes clear that the respondent does not have the moral knowledge that she initially believed she possessed before the encounter with Socrates began. The Socratic Alenchus has both constructive or positive goals and critical or negative goals. The positive goals, the constructive goals, are that it's a method that can help us to acquire knowledge by definition of the essence of moral concepts. And the clearer we understand these moral concepts, it seems to me, the more likely we are to be able to act upon them. So uh, the idea that Socrates has of virtue being connected to knowledge is forwarded by this uh, method of investigating people's beliefs. Moreover, I think the method stimulates others to seek out moral truth for themselves rather than simply presupposing that they already have it. Critically, uh, the Alenchus does make others aware of their unclear or contradictory moral beliefs. And this may be part of the, uh, the hostility that Socrates talks about being created by his method of examining people in public as people, especially socially prominent people who claim to be paragons of virtue, are interrogated and shown not to know anything about morality whatsoever. Um, one of the other goals that we have uh, visible here is that uh, the Alenchus makes others aware of the need for critical self-examination of their moral beliefs. You simply can't presuppose that you have this knowledge. You have to show that you have this knowledge. And when pressed, most people can't do this. For me, the Socratic method is really ultimately about enlightenment. I think the point that Socrates is trying to make is the following. If you think you are already enlightened, then you won't pursue your own enlightenment. No one looks for what they think they already have. 
So part of the elenchus is intended to make us aware that we don't actually have what we think we have. But that's not the end of things. It's only when we become aware of this lack that we will strive to satisfy it and to fill in this gap. We won't fill it in if we don't know it exists. So I think part of what Socrates is trying to get us to do is to take uh, enlightenment generally, our, our, our moral life specifically, seriously, and begin to realize that maybe we don't know all that we need to know, and this might motivate us to engage in the kind of deep critical investigation that he thinks is necessary for us to ultimately achieve the goals of enlightenment and moral virtue. I'm going to conclude this discussion of the Socratic method with a look at a few of the criticisms that have been raised traditionally against Socrates' approach. The first and most obvious one is the claim that Socratic irony masks Socrates' real philosophical doctrines. Socratic irony is Socrates' claim that he doesn't know anything. But a lot of critics have argued that it wouldn't be possible for him to ask the kind of insightful questions that he does of his opponents or those he's, he's interacting with unless he knew where the conversation was going or where he wanted it to go, which presupposes that he may have had um, more knowledge of the moral matters at hand than he's actually letting on. Now, we could possibly respond to this by granting a little bit of the premise, and we could say that it might be possible that Socrates does indeed know a little bit more than the person he's talking to simply because of his experience and previous practice exploring various uh, issues. So, for example, in his conversation with Euthyphro, uh, it might be possible that Socrates has had prior conversations on holiness with other thinkers. And therefore, though he may not know the answer, he may know more than Euthyphro does in the sense of which wrong ways uh, are possible and which, uh, which answers are more plausible. So we can partially grant that Socratic irony is, is, is somewhat disingenuous without having to abandon the claim that Socrates doesn't actually have a complete understanding of the matter uh, about which he's talking. Another criticism uh, is that the Socratic method of cross-examining other people's views, the elenchus, is merely destructive. That is, it makes people aware of their errors it, it gets them to be uncertain about what they took to be the truth, but it doesn't put anything into, into the place of those false beliefs. So it leaves people in a state of moral confusion. And people who are in a state of moral confusion are likely to be more easily misled than other people who may be completely convinced of their views, which may be wrong views, but at least give their, their moral personality a certain... Uh, a certain direction and a certain stability. So that's one possibility and it's clear that the the charge of corrupting the youth must have had something like this in mind that Socrates goes around training people to undermine traditional morality. Uh, and so therefore we could see that the method can be viewed as having a morally corrupting influence on those who are exposed to it, especially to the young. And of course, if young people constantly see that moral authorities actually have no knowledge or can't say what they know, this could lead them to become morally skeptical. The, they could, it could lead them to the idea that, that no moral truths can be discovered, which could be damaging to their moral well-being. It's important to keep in mind, I think, in response to these two claims that this these criticisms are the result of perhaps a one-sided uh, interpretation of the Socratic elenchus. It clearly does have its destructive influences or its destructive aspects. Um, from Socrates' point of view, it's important to destroy your false ideas because they cause you harm. It's the it's only after we, we carry out this critical analysis that we can then clear the ground, so to speak, for, for constructing a belief system that 
is based on true foundations that make sense and that is actually uh, uh, the product of critical analysis. So, yeah, partially it is it is destructive of false beliefs, but the goal ultimately, as Socrates sees it, is actually the opposite of of corruption, the opposite of corruption in the sense that it's intended to cause us to reflect more deeply on on virtue and not just simply accept whatever we happen to hear or whatever our parents or our culture happens to teach us, but to actually examine those beliefs to see if they make sense. And he believes this will make us, in the long run, better, more virtuous people. If his own personality and his own existence can be taken as an example, he's the most critical person that history has ever known practically and yet almost everyone who talks about Socrates who knew him from this period of time people like Plato or Xenophon or others talk about him as the most virtuous person that ever existed or at least at that time so therefore it's not altogether clear that Socratic method has a necessarily corrupting uh, uh, conclusion finally Aristotle uh, is concerned that the method that Socrates is developing is more suitable for the exactness of science. And that is, the, the model, the rationalistic kind of approach to morality that Socrates takes places a lot of burden on acquiring knowledge. And this knowledge is expressed in terms of very precise moral definitions. Now, Aristotle contends that what Socrates is doing is actually thinking about how the sciences operate, at least science as it was viewed by the ancient Greeks, in which you, you deduce necessary conclusions from absolutely true fundamental first premises. Um, this requires a, a very exact definition of the concept at hand. Um, and that method is absolutely appropriate in the science where the goal is to, to achieve knowledge. But Aristotle contends that in, in moral inquiry it's not appropriate because uh, moral, in, uh, mor moral inquiry, morality in general, does not have the exactness that we find in the natural sciences, which is of course true, but I don't think that we have to give uh, everything to Aristotle on this point, of course, that is, even though moral inquiry lacks the exactness of science, that doesn't mean that such exactness can't form a reasonable goal to strive after. Um, it seems to me that the more precisely we can think about these matters of conduct and action, uh, the better off we will be, the more likely we will be to do the right thing when faced with a situation of uncertainty. So I, don't, I think that these, all of these criticisms have valid points, um, but I think they can be mitigated somewhat by a larger, more complete understanding of what Socrates is up to. So now we have an outline of the Socratic method. We know the general strategy and what it's intended to accomplish. And now we need to look at an example of this method in action. And so we're going to read a dialogue called the Euthyphro, written by Plato, who was a student of Socrates. And in the Euthyphro, Plato shows us Socrates doing philosophy as he would typically have done philosophy every day in ancient Athens. He runs into this figure, this person Euthyphro, and they begin to have a conversation about holiness. And Euthyphro will claim to know lots about holiness, but it will turn out as Socrates questions him that he doesn't really know as much as he thinks he knows. Now, this dialogue is written by Plato, as I said. Socrates did not write anything. There are no writings of Socrates at all. Everything we know about him philosophically comes to us through the dialogues of Plato. So this is a reconstruction. It's not a historical document. However, it does portray in a kind of a truthful way how Socrates did philosophy in his everyday life. So our next uh, task will be to look at the Euthyphro, and there will be a lecture that accompanies that, and, it, and we'll see step by step how the Socratic method proceeds and how Socrates investigates Euthyphro's beliefs.